Hi, and welcome back to this, episode 28 of me playing around with this little Chinese mini lathe. Long-term viewers to the show know that we've got a fan, a super fan, and our fan is a guy by the name of Nico. Now, unfortunately, Nico's got a problem, and Nico's problem is he keeps buying broken cars. It's kind of like a, a animal lover, you know, no stray left behind. Well, with Nico, it's no stray car left behind. And of course, once you've got like six broken down cars scattered throughout various garages in the city, sooner or later you need some way of moving them around. So he bought this set of like wheel jack things. You know, so you can pick up the car on all four wheels and move it around. And he thought it was this high quality German design, but it turned out to be a cheap Chinese knockoff, which was a bit disappointing really. And this version's got um, hydraulic jacks to lift the car and they all leak. Now you might be wondering what Nico's unserviceable jacks have to do with me, or us. And honestly, I felt the same way. But one day when I wasn't home, Nico dropped his jacks off in my driveway because he wanted to use my basement to fix them. Nico pulled one jack apart, cleaned everything up, and measured up all the seals, and then contacted the importer. You know you've got a really high quality product when the importer comes back and says, nah, we don't do spare parts. And this is where I need you guys' help. To get this crap out of my driveway, what we need is a new set of seals. And we haven't been able to identify what size these seals are. Like here the piston's got some sort of a Teflon sort of cup-shaped backup seal with an O-ring on it. Um, and I'll put... Nico's gone through and measured all of the seals, but the importer couldn't tell him what the part numbers were. So. If any of you knows anything about hydraulics and can look up or can give us a reference of where to find these, uh, the part numbers for these seals, we would greatly appreciate it. Especially me, because then I can get this junk back out of my driveway. Have any of you built home-built aircraft? You'd know that point known as 90% finished, 90% to go. It looks like an aeroplane, all your friends think, hey, you'll be flying next weekend. Ah, still a lot to do. Well, I'm a bit past that point, but there's still a lot to do. I need to work out some solution for my user control module. I was kind of thinking of putting the monitor sort of up about there, then the keyboard slightly angled below it, and then maybe e-stop button. I bought this cute little membrane keyboard off the German version of Craigslist, and it's pretty cool, so I figured I'd use that for the mini lathe. Now to connect it, it's got a PS2 standard mini DIN port, or this multi-pin port. And it also came with a cable, and the cable has that multi-pin to uh, full-size DIN, I guess, or PS2. My mini computer, which is running this machine, doesn't have a PS2 connection, so I bought a PS2 to USB adapter. So this converts uh, USB using some active electronics into PS2 Mini, so I should just plug it in. Yeah, nah, it's two girls, I'm afraid. I'm gonna need to somehow con connect this, and what I think I'm probably just gonna do is keep the USB plug, keep the active electronics, butcher whichever one of these cables is keyboard, I can't remember whether it's purple or green, but I'm sure I can find that on the internet, and then connect that into this multi-pin connector. Okay, so I've connected that up. I'm not perfectly sure whether I've got the wiring right, but let's check it out. Okay, power comes on. That's good. Oh, cool. So that works. Now, if I'm gonna make a riser block, how tall shall I make it? I mainly use those eight millimeter tool steel blanks. So let's try and get them on the center height. So that's still a little bit low. I think I need to come up a bit higher than 36. Next up, these two bars of tool steel are just slightly below 20 millimeters, or three quarters of an inch. So we'll drop that down onto center height. This uh, threading insert cutter is probably one of the thicker tools I've got. It's got a 12mm shank, 
So let's put that in and see if we can get it onto center height. So 12 mm looks like it's about the maximum size you can fit in these anyway. So that's looking good as well. There's still adjustment. I could get that quite easily onto center height. That looks very good. And now let's try a really small tool. So here's a little carbide boring bar. There's a, there's a V groove in the bottom of this which can clamp it. Okay, so that would also work because it's still clamping on its full length. It's about at the top. That means I need to make a new riser block of 39 millimeters. Well, let's call it 40. So the pitch of the centers of the T-nuts is 44 millimeters by the looks of it. Looking in the scrap bin, I had this piece of scrap for years and there's a faint marking on it, K340. And I remember trying to turn this on this lathe years ago. Once I'd blunted every tool I attacked it with, I went online and looked up K340 and it's actually some sort of tool steel made by the company Bula here in Austria. Um, it's used for sort of punches and you know making making dies and stuff. So as far as I can tell, it's pretty close to kryptonite. So I kind of avoid, like to avoid using that if possible. Another option would be to carve it out of this big slug of 70 by 70, so I meant nearly three inch by three inch um, cast iron. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I know that both Old Tony and Stefan Gotteswinter have uh, done something similar on their lathes. So I guess I better spend some time doing a bit of research. Six hours later. Well, after going down that rabbit hole for, for <laughs> way too long, of course you end up on Rob Ren City's site with his uh, solid tool mount, which is really, really the ultimate solid tool mount. Actually, this old Tony contacted me just last week to ask about some issues with his uh, Maho lube unit. Some people have said that I'm kind of copying his style, but really when we both have a face made for radio and a perfect manicure. I guess you end up with kind of the same sort of things. I was watching Rob Rentz's video where he cut out a big portion of a cast iron tooling block of some description by stitch drilling it from both sides. And that seemed like a much better idea than using an uh, angle grinder, especially seeing as the mess it would make. So let's try that. I won't drill right through in one go. I'll just drill to the middle. So I want to put up a a stop just to make sure I can put this mesh, this metal back in the same place each time. Okay, so this first lap around is just going to spot drill every 3.3 millimeters. I'm not sure if it's a good idea to do this with a 3.2 drill because it's getting close to the limit of its depth, but I guess we'll, guess we'll see. So to make sure this actually works, I'll just swap this out for the drill, which is cool because I get to use my new uh, drill chuck. Okay, now let's restart that cycle, this time drilling down 35 millimeters. Later. Well, that really did work surprisingly well. I didn't even break a drill. There were a couple of times when the drill did wander into other holes and I had to stop it, but I managed to get round all four sides. Yeah, and hopefully that's, that's weakened enough to just bash it off. I mean, the whole process took over an hour, and I probably could have easily got through this with an angle grinder in maybe half that time, but this is more fun. I'd much rather just stand there and watch the, uh, the milling machine do all the cutting than stand around with a grinder. Looks almost like a meat tenderizer. So next off we're going to be squaring off the piece of uh, cast iron with this big 100mm Sandvik insert cutter. One of the pockets is damaged so instead of all six inserts I've just got three in there.
Well, that was a two millimeter depth of cut. This thing really is a beast. Next up, we're going to counterbore those four holes for their screw heads. We need to tap that M10 hole in the middle. So let's use the Tapmatic. These use those really cool rubber flex collets. Plus they also have an extra little drive bit at the back which clamps down on the square of the tap to make sure it drives properly. For this sort of job, these Knipex parallel jaw pliers are really useful because the biggest imperial tools I have are about inch and a, inch and a quarter or so, but this, this is probably inch and a half or so, I'd get a guess. The only problem with the Tapmatic is it's uh, so long. I used the shortest uh, shank I could find for it, but you really can still only have things about this length or lower in the on the table before you you run out of run out of ra room really. I didn't make up an anti-rotation bar which goes into a screw hole over here, but it's also the same hole that I use for mounting this light. And for a one-off job, it's just as easy just to bodge up a, something an anti-rotation arm off the table like this with a clamp and a bit of steel. I mean, there's not a huge load on that when it's running, so as long as it's got something to work against. I'm going to do this with just the mill's quill. When I first got the mill, there was no, no star handle, so I made this one myself. I bought f what I thought was four uh, knobs off eBay. Turns out it was only a pack of three. Now I'm going to run this thing at its slowest speed and just manually feed this tap hole. If I had a whole bunch of them to do, I'd set up a little program to extend down at the, at the speed it's pulling itself in and then rapid reverse because there's a gearbox in here and it comes out faster than it goes in but I'll just do this at the slowest speed so speed 80. What I don't know is the tension I've got set. The manual for the Tapmatic says to set it basically empirically. Um, you set the tension with this this big ring at the top. What I'm doing there is just releasing the clutch. There's a set of marks around here nine eight seven six five four this specific tapmatic's designed for thread sizes of about six millimeters to 16 or no 18 millimeters i think so this this tap is roughly middle of the range so i guess i should probably tighten it down to about five i think i'll go just to four just to be on the safe side if i don't retract before it bottoms out the clutch should should slip Preventing damage. That's the concept. I've, I've never used this into a blind hole before, so I've never had the clutch activate before. So it's all theory at this stage. I've done through holes and the thing worked really nicely, so let's give it a go. That was it. Incredibly cool tool. I'm using Onshape to model this, so all it did is made up the block and then put in a bunch of fillets and 
chamfers and stuff until it looked kind of like how I wanted it to look. So that's it there. And then I just exported it and imported it here into my old version of Feature Cam and designed a toolpath for it. Not exactly the most efficient toolpath in the world, but hey, should work. Well, I'm now set up to perform the last operation, which is then going around with this ball end mill to clean up the sides and hopefully smooth it over nicely. Yeah, let's hope I don't screw it up because quite a bit of work gone into it to this point. So hold your fingers crossed for me, guys. Now you might be wondering why I use such very light weeny tool paths, but I could only mount it to the old riser block with two M6 screws, which are like quarter inch. So I figured I'm gonna take it lightly. We know where this old riser block's going. I think this is a good place to stop for this episode. Thanks a lot for watching and I look forward to seeing you again next time.